Hi everyone, thanks so much for coming to our workshop on ethnic media for outreach professionals. Uh, we're just excited to discuss with you today how to address challenges in newcomer settlement and integration by engaging with multicultural community media. Uh, my name is Blythe Irwin, I'm the Sources and Outreach Director at MIRAMS, uh, which stands for Multilingual International Research and Ethnic Media Services. Our idea for this workshop came about as a result of our daily monitoring of around 800 ethnic media print, web, radio, and TV outlets across Canada. Uh, today, I will be speaking about the role of ethnic media outreach and analysis in the post-pandemic recovery. Uh, please feel free to start sending your questions with the Q&A button as you listen to the presentations and we'll answer them after. Uh, we also have a poll on the ethnic media you can fill out. Um, now I would like to hand over to Madeline Zuniak, who will be uh, kicking off our session. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be on this panel and, and certainly speak to something which is very dear and close to our hearts, and that is Canadian ethnic media. I am here as chair of the Canadian Ethnic Media Association. Uh, the Canadian Ethnic Media Association is comprised of professionals engaged in print, broadcast, web journalism and writing reflecting Canada's diversity. We support the principles of Canadian citizenship, multiculturalism and the right of free expression without ethnocentric bias. We always welcome a lively exchange of ideas and whenever necessary, pursue important issues to the ethnic media, such as the exclusion of ethnic journalists from news sources and information that conventional media may have access to. We're going to do a historical background, but first let's do a snapshot of the present situation of ethnic media. The very existence and evolution of multilingual media in Canada, especially now, is such a rich expression of earned democracy that envelops so many intrinsic Canadian values and experiences. Throughout the generations, immigrant communities, as well as second and third generations, have derived considerable and necessary knowledge about this country from Canadian ethnic media. Later on, we'll talk about when ethnic media was first discovered in Canada. And I think you'll all be surprised at how early uh, it was born here in this country. The Canadian Ethnic Media Association, in order to platform the excellence of journalism in the ethnic terrain, holds every year National Canadian Ethnic Media Awards of Journalistic Excellence. We have just celebrated our 43rd year of these awards. And you can certainly see the categories here that they are, it's a juried award system. And certainly we've had uh, outstanding, outstanding entries throughout the years. In order to significantly understand who's out there in ethnic media, recently we have done, and have done our research and have identified 1,280 verified ethnic media entities and have created the Canadian Ethnic Media Directory. This is just an example of one page of the reach um, you know, and the way the directory looks. So we know that diversity is a national asset as is truly Canadian ethnic media. Canadians who speak so many languages and understand many cultures open international doors as well. And isn't this important as our world continues to evolve and have the challenges that we do presently. Canadian ethnic media is the key that unlocks doors for Canadians, both here and internationally. Canadian multilingual media helps ensure integration and inclusive citizenship with every Canadian and make sure that it will be every Canadian's inheritance. And now we'll take a historical look at ethnic media in Canada. The very existence and evolution of multilingual media in Canada is a rich expression of democracy that envelops so many intrinsic Canadian values and experiences. The role of ethnic media in Canada is nation building and has been significant both in the past and present and is an increasingly multicultural, multilingual and diverse society. Throughout the generations, immigrant communities, as well as second and third generations, have de derived necessary knowledge about this country from broadcasting programs, publications, and more recently, internet streaming and blogs. The inherent contribution of multilingual media in Canada involved from a true need to have not only information in one's language of comfort, but also relevant editorial perspective, reflective of ethnoculturally commu community leadership ethno-specific and other relevant social issues. 
the cohesive bond that binds communities is this need for distinct information, which provides a context for many Canadians of multicultural backgrounds. As waves of immigration arrived, the establishment of multilingual media provided a platform for ethnocultural community building, assisted in the process of settlement and contributed to a sense of community stability. It continues to form a bridge to the understanding and acceptance of this country, inclusive of the privileges, rights and responsibilities of Canadian citizenship. Ethnic media was and is a key contributor to the feeling of belonging with a linguistic and or ethnocultural community. It also contributes to the contextualization of oneself to the larger Canadian society and encourages, importantly, self-esteem. As traditional media seems to diminish and access to marginal voices seem to be more important, ethnic media continues to develop an important role in the expression and reflection of diverse communities. The impact of ethnic media is revealed in the following key streams. For recent and new immigrants, it is a necessary and desired lifeline that is not only a conduit to Canadian life shaping information, but also a lens for the interpretation of Canadian standards, values, and quality of life. Engaging in this very real connection with multilingual communities using the comfort of mother tongue significantly increases authenticity and cultural relevance for audiences. And for subsequent generations, continuity provided by comprehension of the mother tongue and cultural traditions leads to the reaffirmation of ethnic identity. Now, the evolution of ethnic media in Canada coincided with the very arrival of immigrants communities to this country. A historical perspective reveals that shortly arriving in Canada, establishing a newspaper was important and a necessary priority. The beginnings can be traced to one of the first newspapers in Canada. The Halifax Gazette began publishing in 1752. The founder, John Bushel, took on a German partner, Anton Henrik, who introduced Canada's first ethnic newspaper. And in, 19, in 1787, Anton Henrik, a German immigrant, had become publisher and from the Gazette Press began publishing in German. So ethnic media in Canada underscores the need and value of communication in a language of comfort with relevant content to a specific community not adequately served by traditional media. The value of ethnic media is also demonstrated in the settlement and integration process and is manifest by the regard with which communities attribute to ethnic media as a trusted and welcome source of information. This is further exemplified by the experience that even if similar information is available from other sources, the medium of choice is ethnic media. Furthermore, as individuals age and are living, as individuals age and are living in other than their country of origin, they tend to revert to their native tongue. And we know that our senior population continues to grow. As a third pillar of communication in Canada, ethnic media is not only a bridge to accessible content, but also serves as a barometer of positive portrayal, acceptance, self-expression and identity. I see that I am at my time limit. I had a lot more things to say, but um, I will certainly end with saying that Canadian ethnic journalists, editors, publishers, and broadcasters tend to be community leaders, opinion makers, and entrepreneurs. The community leadership contr contributes to the enrichment, sophistication, and positive dynamic of Canadian society. As I said, Diversity is a national asset, as is Canadian ethnic media. And now I will throw over to our next panelist, which is George Abraham. George? Thank you, Madeline. It's, it's always hard to uh, follow in your footsteps. And so uh, it's an honor to be on this panel with uh, such eminent people like Andrew and Madeline and Andresh and Silke and, uh, and, and Blythe. Uh, I am the publisher of New Canadian Media, which um, 
as, as you may know, sits at the very intersection of what we call ethnic and mainstream media. So my uh, argument uh, for this panel is that over the last couple of years, we've seen a growing convergence between what is called ethnic and what is mainstream. Uh, as, as Canada becomes more and more multicultural, uh, I've noticed that newsrooms are making fairly diligent efforts to diversify their own newsrooms. And so uh, we at New Canadian Media have been very privileged to be at, to, to sit at that very intersection of, of these two uh, solitudes. Now, how can multicultural or ethnic media be of use and serve as a communications conduit for newcomer uh, communities. I think it's absolutely essential, and I'm sure a lot of other people on this panel will argue that, uh, as Madeline just said, uh, it's the almost the first port of call for most newcomers in Canada. However, we've also noticed that the, the profile of immigrants is changing. Uh, they tend to be higher qualified with advanced uh, qualifications. And my own sense is that they kind of probably keep ethnic media in the background while then subscribing to television and, and uh, newspapers that would be called mainstream. So it, I think it's a bit of a outdated uh, way of describing reaching out to newcomer communities through just one channel. I think uh, outreach is best done uh, across both channels. Uh, I've also noticed that a lot of settlement agencies now have professional communications advisors to help them reach communities. And they do that through both ethnic and mainstream media. Uh, before I, I wrap up, I just want to demonstrate to you that as Canada changes, the media landscape is also changing. Uh, you will notice that in my backdrop, I have the logo of uh, a group of publications called Village Media. Village Media has 18 titles in Canada, and uh, they generally are what we call hyper-local journalism. We've partnered with them in a way that makes sure that every story that we publish in English, we, we publish in both English and French, but every story that we publish in English is also carried on every village media title. Uh, I'm also happy to report that we have just recently signed a syndication agreement with the Winnipeg Free Press uh, so that we will be writing stories for the Winnipeg Free Press. As, as you will uh, note, this is a fairly significant milestone. Uh, again, I think it speaks to the convergence of uh, mainstream and ethnic. Um, we've also had bylines uh, from our reporters in the, in the Toronto Star. Our stories are carried by Canadian Press under uh, an initiative called the Local Journalism Initiative. So all of this, uh, from my humble point of view, suggests that uh, the media landscape is changing. Communications professionals should take note, not just of the changing landscape of Canadian media, but also the changing profile of immigrants arriving in this country. Uh, with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Andrew Griffith, who uh, I'm proud to say we are both uh, fellow inhabitants of Ottawa and uh, in my humble opinion, Canada's foremost policy expert on immigration. Over to you, Andrew. Well, thanks, George, for that uh, introduction. A bit of an exaggeration in my view. I'm not the foremost, but I have developed a certain expertise following my retirement from IRCC when I was last uh, the Director General of Citizenship and Multiculturalism. And since then, I've been doing a fair amount of writing on, on those issues. So I'm going to share a short deck. The uh, I'm going to focus on the first number of slides, 
And I think this actual deck will be circulated to attendees later, and that'll have more of the details on the research. Okay, this was a sort of a, uh, some joint work that I and Mirams did under an initiative called Diversity Votes Canada. We wanted to get a sense of how election coverage um, was captured um, by, uh, by ethnic media. And so we spent a period of time, about six months or six, eight months, looking at ethnic media coverage. And this analysis are, shows the results. So let's start going through the slides. So just cover briefly the methodology and limitations of what we were doing. I'm gonna show some of the summary data and just sort of highlight some of the analysis that emerged. So Miriam has provided the media summaries, um, uh, which without that, we couldn't have done it. Uh, we developed a series of keywords to try and identify the issues, which we modified as the election went on. The sources obviously reflect the ethnic group size, uh, the strength of the media, which we generally measure through how frequently they publish, and what the coverage was. Um, and overall, there was sort of over coverage of Chinese and Punjabi media just because their sectors are, are more active. And again, we divided and sort of what was the coverage before the writs were issued, before the election started, and what happened afterwards. And we looked at about 2,500 articles. So this slide really looks at sort of the first, the first on the left, it's really sort of looking at um, the demographics. So it, it's, look, it's comparing the coverage of the issues, like how many, what was the coverage, the number of publications, and then showing if the uh, coverage understated the number of publications or overstated. So you can see, in fact, it's South Asian um, under coverage in our in our study was about by 10%, whereas Chinese was uh, over by about twice that. And then on the right hand side, it was really looking at sort of the uh, population figure and 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 the actual uh, coverage. And again, you see there that South Asians and uh, Chinese were overrepresented in relation to the size of the population. Uh, black. Um, what had the most serious uh, underrepresentation, um, and maybe that's partially due to the fact there's a lot of English media uh, or French media in the case of Haitians. Uh, but those are sort of the, some of the highlights, just get a sense of where we had better representation and where we didn't. Uh, the next slide sort of compares um, the pre and the post writ period. And so what you see in the pre-writ periods, there's are more general articles on Canadian politics in the lead up to the election. And then once the writ is issued, suddenly it goes down. But the more interesting aspect is that it's co immigration coverage, which was relatively low at the beginning before the campaign started, suddenly doubled. And I think that's sort of natural because a lot of uh, the ethnic media obviously will focus on issues important to readers. And um, again, immigration issues and related issues is really part of that uh, need to serve uh, readers. And then here we just sort of did a little sort of chart, um, you know, trying to show uh, how it changed between the pre-writ period and the post-writ period. And again, I think the sort of the striking things was again the sort of candidate, more candidate profiles more focus on immigration, more focus on the ethnic vote. Um, some of the issues that had been early in the campaign, before the campaign, were important, sort of started to fade. Um, and uh, you can see that there, uh, multiculturalism and foreign interference didn't really go up all that much, I would have thought more. And of course, once the campaign was over, the results became the focus. And this looks at sort of the, uh, coverage by issue and by party. So you can see that, you know, coverage of the campaign was pretty consistent across the, the main four parties. Um, candidate coverage, and which is tends to be sort of like candidate profiles, interestingly enough, seem to be more focused upon the NDP and, and the Green. Um, immigration, you know, Fair, you know, some variations, Green Party uh, more so than others, interestingly enough, but it's just a relatively small sample. 
um, the liberals more than the NDP or the conservatives, which is also significant. Um, and of course, uh, uh, Bernier's party, the PPC, ran on an anti-immigration uh, platform. So that's, that was the focus of, of attention on him. Uh, the election date issue was just sort of one sort of candidate in, I figure which riding, one conservative candidate who was complaining about the election date and it fell on a Jewish holiday. So that got a lot of airtime, but it was virtually just before the election, before the writ was dropped, and then it just dropped off completely. Um, China had a fair amount of coverage by the major parties, um, less so with the NDP. Um, and the liberals and the NDP all focused more on multiculturalism than the other parties, which I think is also significant. Um, Green Party, no surprise, would focus on climate change. And, um, and Bernier's party, um, you know, focused on third party funding issues and leaders debate because those are the, he was trying to get into the leaders debate and that become, became an issue. The block is less relevant here because there's really minimal coverage uh, on the block, um, given again that most of the sources that we were looking were sort of uh, more based in English Canada than Quebec. And here's sort of the, the summary lessons is sort of, I think, you know, the test that I was applying when I was looking at this was really if you relied on ethnic media as your main source, and of course, there's a variety of different ethnic media there, you know, would you have enough information to be able to vote uh, and feel comfortable voting for one party or the other? And my general, and, and, and I didn't use, let's say, the Globe and Mail as the benchmark. My sort of benchmark was the Toronto Sun for the sake of argument. So, you know, populist media and everything like that, um, and their news coverage, not their commentary. Um, and my general sense was that, yes, by and large, if you're following ethnic media and you're following the election coverage in, the, in ethnic media, you will have enough information to be a reasonably informed uh, voter, or at least, uh, you know, not much different from, uh, from most voters. Uh, the second point was really that the media did encourage political participation in voting. And I just put a few quotes here, which I thought were, you know, symbolize that. And I think that's important. Like it's not, a, it, you know, the, they recognize the importance of the civic duty to vote. They recognize the importance that it has in terms of policies that will affect Canadians uh, and, and the different groups that form Canada. And uh, the, the third point was really that the media did encourage understanding of issues and party positions. It's sometimes not as sophisticated, again, as you would see in the globe, um, but sometimes more sophisticated than you'd see in the Toronto Sun. So, you know, a reasonable approach there. And of course, um, which is normal, there was some championship of same ethnic origin candidates, and that's to be expected. It's just like uh, other communities like LGBTQ will champion some of their candidates. So I'm going to um, leave it there. So I'll leave it like that. Uh, again, I do encourage you to read the rest of the deck because uh, you'll find more of the granularity that I think will interest some of you and may surprise some of you. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Silke who's with Mirams and is going to take us to the next step. Thank you. Hello, I'm Silke and I'm the editor in chief with Mirams. And I also looked at the sort of qualitative uh, content of the ethnic media. Um, what you would find if you could read the 30 plus languages that we are monitoring. And um, I looked at two specific areas, one of them being COVID reporting and one of them being also the election. Uh, so that's some overlap with, uh, with Andrew's presentation. Um, so at Miram's, we see ethnic media as the eyes and ears of the local audiences, or at least one of, <laughs> one of the eyes and one of the ears. And uh, on the other hand, also as a, a mouthpiece, as an expression of the community. And uh, ethnic media have the function of transmitting and, and translating knowledge of Canadian society and politics, and they have an advocacy function for the newcomer communities. So what do we find in the ethnic media? 
We find a lot of uh, the Canadian provincial and local news that you would also find in the mainstream, uh, but translated and often commentated on by the anchors and hosts. Uh, we find features on local community initiatives and events, um, celebrations, uh, the local uh, religious festivals, um, just uh, incidents that happen in the community. We find awareness raising on health and social issues, discussions of issues of particular interest to newcomers like immigration and housing, are of course, um, high profile topics. And we usually find a fairly substantial segment on Homeland News um, coverage in addition to the Canadian coverage. So Mirams did a review of COVID-19 reporting in a paper on ethnic media lessons from 2020 for an inclusive recovery. And we found that the ethnic media broadcast almost daily excerpts from statements and press conferences and press releases from the public health officers, the provincial ones and the federal ones and the local ones, as well as from politicians from the three levels of government. We found coverage and discussion that is also found in mainstream media articles like the Globe and Mail or Toronto Star, as well as a discussion on scientific reports and findings. We found a lot of interviews with medical and other experts from the local community that explained and reinforced public health messaging. And we found information about the pandemic measures, about assistance programs that uh, newcomers could access, about mental health, about schools, uh, real estate, other related issues. Uh, so this is the information relay role where um, ethnic media has a role in presenting information to the ethnic audience from government and other experts in a way that's culturally and linguistically relevant. And this helps fight against social media disinformation. Uh, we also found a lot of interviews with uh, community members on the street. Uh, so ordinary parents at schools, um, just individuals, random individuals on the street basically, but from that ethnic group uh, with teachers, uh, interviews with business owners and parents, faith leaders, unions, NGOs, spokespersons, but always from the relevant community and analysis of how the pandemic affects different communities. And we found uh, reporting on initiatives that community members were taken to raise awareness about public health measures, about uh, mental health and charitable initiatives. For example, there was a lot of reporting on the different task forces like the South Asian task force, Punjabi COVID task force, Muslim COVID task force, Latin American COVID task force. And there were stories on local initiatives like handing out special adapted masks for men that are wearing turbans or like initiatives to communicate in, uh, in, in locally relevant language. What is a two meter distance and, and why is it important to wear masks and, and things like that. So there is uh, the information function and then there is the advocacy function of the ethnic media. Um, so part of the advocacy messages that we saw was that newcomers are overrepresented among the high exposure workers like meat processing staff, factory work, personal care staff, transport and retail, that newcomers are often part of multi-generational households and therefore more exposed to COVID um, infection that newcomers were unable to obtain uh, to, to maintain physical distancing because they can't work from home as easily. They don't have paid sick leave for job security. They have to rely on childcare and they're more likely to use public transportation. Uh, we saw higher risks of exposure also compounded by higher risks of pre-existing conditions like diabetes or car uh, cardiovascular disease. <laughs> and on the other hand, socially, we saw that newcomers were targeted by polarized accusations that their culture is driving the spread <laughs> and experienced more racism during the pandemic. We also saw public health measures affected newcomers in particular because they were blocking immigration and travel and therefore family reuni reunification. And newcomer children were particularly affected because parents were less able to help them with their schoolwork in English. Um, with respect to the federal election, and some of this has been covered, but we found that the ethnic media presented again a lot of statement and press conferences from the party leaders and candidates, which you would have also found in the mainstream. Coverage of debates and polls, and then later the election results, information on how to vote and calls to the ethnic community to vote, discussion of the main election issues and a fair bit of coverage on the party's positions on issues related to the home ban, like the ban on direct flights to India or foreign relations with, for example, China. 
uh, we found coverage on the local campaigns, particularly in the ridings with high proportions of a specific ethno-linguistic community, uh, coverage of the position and backgrounds of candidates from that community, and coverage of incidents like racist incidents in the local communities. What was striking is that like, the Canadian system is set up for MPs to represent a geographic constituency that where they are elected, but then in the ethnic media also championed candidates as a representative for the ethnic group. So you have South Asian representatives that are presented as, okay, these are the Punjabi representatives. And in the Filipino media, you had Filipino candidates presented in a way that portrayed them as representatives of all Filipinos. So there was this notion that when Reggie Valdez won in Mississauga, that she was uh, the Filipino Canadian who was now going to be the Filipino Canadian representative in the House of Commons for all across Canada. Um, so for us, we see the ethnic media as the eyes and ears of the local communities, and we see them as a bridge between the mostly Anglophone or Francophone government and research institutions on the one hand, and the multilingual citizenry on the other hand. Um, they are a way to fight misinformation from Canada and also from around the world. They convey government messages and expert messages, and they reflect the local voices of the ethnic community. So they are part of the communications fabric of society, obviously alongside the mainstream media and alongside social media. Uh, they are often ignored though, and uh, they could have a key positioning as a conduit to and from diverse communities. Uh, they can be helpful in restoring social cohesion after COVID-19 and um, we feel that corporate and government leaders should recognize ethnic media as an asset among others uh, in the fight against COVID and in communication outreach campaigns. And that's my presentation and with that I will hand it back over to Blythe. Hi, um, so my name is uh, Blythe Irwin. I'm the Sources and Outreach Director at Murums. And um, today I will be presenting the uh, Murums latest white paper to highlight lessons learned from the 23rd Metropolis Conference uh, and their impact and relevance for ethnic media relations. Uh, Drawn from a thorough review of several panels attended by Miram's analysts, the paper provides actionable intelligence to Canadian stakeholders who wish to walk the road to recovery while engaging in a dialogue with multilingual media. Uh, the paper delineates specific steps that the healthcare sector, settlement services, higher education, and employers invested in a diverse workforce should consider to succeed. We hope that this white paper will act as a catalyst in instigating affirmative media relations action and change across public and private enterprises. Uh, effective DEI management necessitates a step into, um, it necessitates a deep dive into the ethnic communities it intends to engage. And while it can be effective to do so, the process can be made smoother by accessing the right channels of communication and knowledge, such as multilingual ethnic media, which is the first point of assimilation into Canada for many immigrants. On the path of integration, the first go-to source for immigrants is their community media. To newcomers, it is an invaluable source where they can access information on how to find work, as well as network through their community organizations. However, these platforms often are echo chambers divorced from mainstream job search and professional organizations. Job ads above all corporate ones are scarce in the ethnic media, while diverse job seekers among the audience are not. Uh, by drawing on actionable ethnic media intelligence, employers can become aware of the various industries of interest in different ethnic communities, formulate ideal strategies to attract new talent, comprehend the issues immigrants face while settling in Canada, and mitigate the barriers that they face in the workplace. Access to services in one's language is one of the social determinants of health, and thus language services are integral to providing effective health care. However, a collaborative approach needs to go beyond settlement or translation service providers and extend to other direct modes of communication with immigrants. This is where the ethnic media can play a role, not only as conduits, but as active promoters. Uh, throughout the pandemic, local media has played a pivotal role in keeping multilingual communities informed, 
countering misinformation and spreading awareness. Most recently, the ethnic media has become rife with community opinions and debates on vaccination. In this context, Canadian ethnic media is very well placed medium of outreach since it not only serves as a lifeline to most newcomers as they integrate into Canadian life, but it is an empathetic us voice and not a sympathetic institutional one. For any organization hoping to address vaccine and other pandemic concerns, ethnic media intelligence and outreach are invaluable. Community media could be the missing piece in the puzzle of Canada's pandemic recovery program. The previous Metropolis Conference further highlighted a major barrier within the sector, uh, the inability to track newcomers through their settlement journey, punctuated by the lack of two-way communication amongst different stakeholders. Uh, this issue brings to light the need for a robust data collection system that will help develop a storehouse of knowledge and encourage coordinated efforts within the sector. While surveys, interviews, and studies are an excellent source of gathering relevant data, ethnic media is an often ignored piece of the puzzle, even though having an ear to ethnic media sources is imperative if one is to fill the gaps in data collection. Listening to ethnic media must form a foundational part of the Know Your Audience Guidebook for the settlement services sector. Furthermore, many immigrants remain unaware of the services and support available to them and often hold back from reaching out. Multilingual media is a key tool in spreading awareness, interacting directly with newcomers, and addressing any reservations towards service providers. A medium that is trusted by the community and engages with immigrants in their native language ought to become an integral part of all settlement strategies. A Canadian ethnic media should form a significant part of any higher education institution's outreach strategy. International students often pick universities and colleges based on the feedback they receive from family and friends already living in Canada. Information dissemination through community media ensures that the efforts made by educational institutions to accommodate international students are brought to the attention of prospective students. Furthermore, ethnic media is often where international students have a voice and can put forth their opinions and concerns. To make sure that they are not speaking into a void, universities should utilize the invaluable intel that can be mined from ethnic media platforms regarding the international student experience and expectations. If colleges and universities want to continue attracting international student talent, then they must step up and make the effort. Uh, there is another dimension in which multilingual media can play an important role for university recruitment, and that is promoting and tracking their image in target communities homeland media and make Canada a top of mind destination again for students uh, considering studying abroad. A key overarching takeaway is that a uh, more proactive strategy of communication with newcomers needs to be adopted, uh, one that is steeped in linguistic and cultural understanding. If immigrants are to pave the way to pandemic recovery, uh, then the least one can do is speak through media most accessible to them and listen to them where their voices are the loudest. Uh, please feel free to visit our website uh, where you may download this white paper. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and with that, I will uh, introduce our next panelist, who is the uh, Miram's president, Andres Mahalski, uh, and he will be speaking to us today via pre-recorded video due to internet connection issue. Hello, everybody. My name is Andres Mahalski. And uh, my first ethnic media relations gig was in 1977, and it involved the promotion of a Chilean Greek refugee musical ensemble and a collection of Canadian fiction, poetry, and other literature in translation. Fast forward, thank you for being here, and I thank you for your time, and uh, allow me to introduce you the result of uh, the learning of all these years. 10 tips for inclusive ethnic media relations in a diverse society. Let me get you in the mood. Imagine you have a job as a researcher, which I think probably some of you do, or as an outreach worker, or work at a corporation and uh, are one of uh, the new diversity, equity and inclusion managers. Uh, or you have a research project involving diversity, need to promote a program or have an issue on the factory floor that would benefit from community involvement. 
So here we go. The first thing that we have to understand is that multilingual media is a unique expression of multicultural policy in our diverse reality. You see, nowhere in the world has our research been able to find such a strong, organized, diverse multilingual media segment. And I believe to say that with some honesty that we owe this to the 50 years of multicultural policy and practice in Canada. So once we've said that clearly and know that there's a big audience out there for this media, we also must understand that the existence of specific ethnic community media outlets is a metric of that community's development. Let me explain this. The least expensive channels to support are radio and nowadays web, of course. Print and TV require greater infrastructure and advertising and revenue, and they come later. So you have to look at what is the demographic of your community and what is development to be able to figure out what kind of media you might be able to access in terms of reaching that audience. Approach. Okay, this is where you reach for the aspirin or the scotch, depending on your choice. Uh, diverse media is an important communications asset because our Reality is diverse, demographically diverse, linguistically diverse. But it's a challenge to media to manage and research. The issue is very simple. I say CBC or the Globe and Mail, and you can visualize it. I say Sing Tao or Corriere Canadese, and some of you may not. So one has to do one's homework. If you don't know who you're talking to, you will not make any sense to them. Second point to understand is localization. You have to treat ethnic media as local community media, even if the community is geographically spread out. And yes, there's a national multilingual TV today, just as national print and radio. Their formula for success is largely community advertising and based on local businesses. Where the people are and shop, there is the media in their language. And the little map here shows you that definitively Ontario is the largest settlement province in terms of all media, all languages. How does one approach any media relationship, but in particular one which is cross-cultural? One has to be empathetic and understand the journalistic context of reality. It's a space where Policy meets community entrepreneurship. That's the only way I have a way of explaining it. Where expat writers are reinventing themselves in their new home. It is a space where policies of separating editorial and advertising are not so strong. And the economic need often makes them go hand in hand. One has to understand that reality when one's approaching these uh, outlets. The second thing is focus, quite simply. Make your story about your audience, not about you. To engage ethnic journalists, you must make the story interesting to their audience. Put yourself in their shoes. Shift your focus from a what's in it for me, as the promoter of a cause or a project, to what's in it for them. In other words, the people you are trying to address. Connection. Connection. It means essentially getting out of your echo chamber in one way or another, out of your comfort zone. Another secret of multilingual media relations is to reach out to the journalists and overcome that mutual fear of an unknown language. Of course, that means finding out more about who you're talking to. Again, and following up to see what they did with your story. Again, it means establishing a relationship. And a relationship that has to be couched in appropriate language. The medium is the message in this case, and that translation can betray it. You have to make sure that your languages and messages do not hit rake grass, breaks in the grass by raising cultural taboo flags or things like that. And you, you use the vocabulary of the expat community, not that of the homeland academics. And then, again, back to building relationships. Get on the journalist's speed dial and be their go-to source. Let me try to explain this on, on the issues that you own. Provide stories that the media needs and wants more of. 
the art of media relations is getting on your targets, <laughs> your target journalist speed dial, not getting them on yours. You know, when journalists call you, you know you got them. So, moving on here, understand ethnic media relations as one on one intercultural communication. Ethnic media relations are an exercise in this. You bring your culture to the table, whether in an unconscious presentation of your dominant privilege, long standing sympathies, empathies, animosities, you. And they have their own culture. And this is a cooperation which sometimes runs into snags. And this is why one has to be careful. The other thing has to do with a trend I've noticed. We should address the ethnic media, but respect their identity. And, and, and sometimes there's an imbalance in this. For example, some communicators either ignore the ethnic media entirely or acknowledge its importance, but don't know how to deal with it. And then they start holding meetings with ethnic media separate from mainstream media conferences. This is a no-no. I mean, you don't want to get even into the suspicion of that you're transmitting a different message to one audience than to the other, okay? You can facilitate by providing translation services, but put them all in one place and make sure they're all on the same page with your message. Otherwise, you're using diversity as a form of exclusion, and I don't think that's what we're here for. Okay, the bottom line here is engagement. If you're not engaging with the multilingual media in your community, you're not really engaging with the community, because Okay, I'm not saying the media defines the community, but it is, in a way, an influencer and an expression of the opinions in that community. And whether or not you as an organization can engage with the ethnic media is, for me, a test of your real understanding of multiculturalism, both as a diverse demographic reality and as a policy aspiration. So to conclude very quickly here, let me know if you have any questions. And thank you very much for your listening time with this and your thinking about it. And my parting message is that each case, each situation must be dealt with with an acute sense of the ridiculous in order to avoid it. I'll be happy to answer any questions, general or about a specific, a specific case. And that's it, folks. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, that concludes our, the presentation section of the workshop. Uh, we're now going to get into the question and answers. Uh, so everyone, please feel free to type any questions you have in the Q&A box. Um, uh, read out the first one here that's come through. We've got um, how many different languages are available and what are the different types of media available? I'd like to answer that. I'd, I'd like to say that certainly in Toronto, Ontario, we have more than 250 languages spoken. Um, in our research for the directory, we identified across Canada, 1,200 active media entities, which includes you know, podcasting, uh, blogging, publications, radio and television. So when you look at the cumulative um, amount, it is more, has more impact than so-called traditional media in Canada. When you bring together all of these local sources, as uh, Andrew you know, very much uh, identified, um, that there is impact. I don't know if anybody wants to add, add to that, but um, certainly we've identified that Ontario is the breadbasket. Um, but certainly, um, you know, there's a lot of emerging and developing multilingual media across Canada, which serves even a more important role, really. Yeah, from um, our perspective at Miram's, the majority that uh, we monitor on a regular basis are, you know, in the Vancouver area, the Toronto area. Um, we've got a representation in Calgary, Edmonton, Montreal, uh, Ottawa. Uh, those are the main centers in terms of where we see the, uh, the regularity and the, the concentration. 
Um, next up, uh, let me see here. We've got, uh, is there a risk of having something called ethnic media that is different from mainstream media? How do you do this cost benefit analysis? I'd be happy to take that, although I don't quite understand the second part of the question. Uh, I think it, and it's been a, a topic of debate, both within and outside media in terms of whether or not ethnic is the best word to represent what is really non-mainstream. But what is mainstream, you know, uh, with a growing immigrant population, there are going to be more people who look like me and sound like me uh, in the years to come uh, than uh, perhaps uh, folks who look like Andrew. So, uh, you know, what is mainstream, what is, what is mainstream, uh, et cetera. So, um, you know, I think the words multicultural media has been used, the words ethnocultural media has been used. So, um, but it's a good uh, point of discussion for sure. Thanks for the question. If I can just mm -hmm. piggyback on that, I think there has to be a distinction for multilingual ethnic media. This has been debated for years and years. I think the best example is um, the way the Black community, Black media has made Black a proud and a good word. Um, so I think there needs to be a point of distinction, differentiation, and I challenge anybody to come up with a better word. We, we have bandied about multilingual, multicultural, um, you know, ethnicity is important, and ethnic um, should be and is, I think, a positive word, a differentiation. Yeah, well, I, I think I agree with both of you uh, in terms of, um, well, maybe ethnic is not the right word. We, I'm a linguist by background. So basically for me, the issue has always been to make language barriers transparent, to break that translation betrays, uh, you know, the one that made uh, Ford introduce their fantastic Nova model into Brazil, but they forgot that no, va, means it doesn't go. So those are the kind of issues that we see that are the barriers that have to be broken down in terms of why there should be multilingual outreach into the communities, okay? Yes, and maybe it's not that we do the multilingual outreach. Uh, you can send the press release out in English quite happily. There'll be someone along the line, a qualified journalist in the ethnic media who Transcreate it, translate it for you, and publish it for you, okay? Because it's news, because it's relevant, basically. So. Blight, if I may, uh, but I think it becomes particularly problematic when people use ethnic as less than mainstream standard. Uh, I've noticed a particular condescension and patronizing uh, approach when it comes to. Uh, dealing with you know the smaller publications or, or community publications uh, and and uh, i think we should guard ourselves against having that differential standard uh, and i would argue that one of the reasons why we've been more we've been successful as a platform is because we believe journalism has just one set of standards it doesn't matter whether you are uh, from uh, from an immigrant or a non-immigrant or or whatever community, uh, uh, so I just wanted to make that point. But I think this is my, if I may add to that, I think this is the advocacy piece. I think uh, this is all about self-affirmation. I think all of us who grew up, you know, in the in the fifties, uh, sixties, where um, you know there was a cone of embarrassment, like you can't identify your ethnic identity. I think it's so important to be proud to speak various languages, not be not to be told on the subway or streetcar, um, you know, don't you know, you have to speak English, don't speak another language. And I think we've elevated the argument there. And I think this is where ethnic media plays a real role in self-esteem, in promoting multiculturalism, multilingualism. So I think it's all about um, you know being proud of who you are as an identity. And I think this is where, um, you know, it's fight or flight. 
with the words multilingual or ethnic. I think that, you know, the, the uh, media community, the multilingual com media community, ethnic community has grappled with this argument for 50 years, quite frankly. And, uh, you know, diversity means something different. Um, so it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful um, exercise to have to think about. And I think it's taken us a long time and we're still there. We've had trouble defining this too. Uh, basically, we took several factors. I mean, obviously, uh, we had to grapple with the fact that in the case of the Jewish community, ethnicity or the differentiating factor was a religious one, as uh, Andrew has just explained. It became a showstopper for the elections uh, or for an attitude, shall we say. Uh, in other cases, uh, it is uh, the physical appearance. Okay, we were looking at racialized communities for whom the issue of identity is very seriously one of race relations, okay? Uh, in other cases, it's language, okay? When I think of the new, absolute newcomer to the country who hasn't quite grasped English as a language, uh, the fact that there's media available to them, and this is very important for settlement agencies if it might hit the target here with some of the audience, and very important for researchers because these are the most disenfranchised and the most vulnerable people. Okay, how many in this audience speaks Ukrainian? Because there are... 65,000 applicants. That's my latest news, probably more now. Okay, it's the same amount of people who speak Afghani. And we have, I don't know how many thousands of Afghani refugees who are already in the country and grappling with settlement issues. That's all. I see some of the questions are saying, are you suggesting that multi, multilingual media is the same as ethnic media? Um, I, I think, you know, that that's an interesting issue. I think that, you know, ethnocultural editorial perspective can also be in English, um, but certainly, you know, having editorial perspective, cultural mores uh, translated into a language of comfort is also important. So this is a, you know, again, a very dynamic uh, issue that uh, I, I think is very important to Canada. And, and I, also like to include the fact that you know our in, the indigenous communities first nation communities in canada continue to try to you know reaffirm their language because they know that language is comfort and language is identity once you lose your language your your culture starts to be eroded so i think that is a very good example of um, why language is important but equally is editorial ethnocultural perspective and equally is reflection of leadership of a diverse community in Canada. So it's not a sort of not it's not a one answer kind of answer. It has to be inclusive of all of those dynamics that are so important to who we are here. I would like to hear what was meant by the cost benefit analysis in terms of outreaching to the ethnic media versus outreaching to the mainstream media, is it worth it? it? Depends. If you're offering loans for newcomers, maybe it is. If you get my point. So what's your message to anonymous attendee here? I think, you know, the message is that, you know, as Canada continues to increase immigration with world events, um, how are you reaching, you know, the, the, the new citizens, the newcomers of Canada? And, you know, this is where it, it, the, the role is extremely important because immigration is not going away. As we see, it's, um, it's, it's so crucial and certainly communicating and contributing to a healthy Canadian citizenry. And, uh, you know, democracy is such a delicate, it is in delicate balance. And this is where it continues to be a very important um, vehicle of expression and important to our environment and to the population of Canadians. I just like to add something. I mean, we always try and, you know, do a cost benefit analysis. And so the one example I always come back to is look who the politicians talk to who they're trying to get votes from, and what are the means they use to reach those voters? 
And ethnic media is a essential part of that strategy. So if you're aiming for voters in Brampton, you're gonna make sure you talk to the, the Punjabi media. Um, and you know, if we remember uh, the previous government, they actually preferred ethnic media, uh, you know, in terms of their outreach than a lot of the mainstream media, partially because ethnic media journalists tend to be less combative, let's say, than uh, reporters from the Globe or from the Star. Um, but there's another issue here, like the questions you have, Mr. Anonymous or Ms. Anonymous, are good ones. But I really am reluctant to comment too much because I think it really is important in these kinds of sessions to, to use your name. I don't like anonymous comments on Twitter. I don't like anonymous uh, uh, comments elsewhere. And I think really the, these forums should have open names. If you say something, and these are all valid questions, you should name yourself. I um, mean, in terms of, I just wanted to address the um, ethnic media is not for white Canadians. Uh, it, they're in terms of European uh, background for ethnic media. Yes, there are. There is plenty of strong ethnic media outlets for whether it's the Russian, the Ukrainian community, the Romanian community, Polish. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot um, of the European based ethnic media in Canada. So I just wanted to highlight that. Um, and then, I'd also like to add there that I think, you know, what George is trying to do with new Canadian media is actually be part of that bridge between what's happening in the, the different communities, but publishing it in English and French. So that's more broadly. And of course, you're also succeeding in getting some of those articles in the quote mainstream media. And I think that that's very important. The whole cross cross cultural concept is, is, is so key. And uh, Gone are the days when you were a journalist and they would say, oh, you're part of this community, um, you know, you're going to be biased. And the point being is that you have the inside track. And if we can be a bridge, and I think it's, it's I have to applaud, you know, George for doing, having these initiatives. Um, the, the inside track is from individuals from, you know, your community, your ethno-specific community, who have the trust of the audience. And that's key. And you're bringing forward stories that sometimes, you know, um, traditional journalists have a uh, challenging time penetrating some taboo topics in these communities. And this is where the journalists, the ethnocultural journalists, multilingual journalists have the golden key to reach, you know, to reach their audiences. Yeah, and if I may add, um... We often have a, a habit of looking at it from our own narrow perspectives, Madeline and me as journalists, uh, we are thinking of it from the point of view of the industry. However, we should also look at it from the point of view of the audience, because what happens is that the audience gets fragmented, audiences get insular. And so there's no, what I would call cross pollination. The, Every country needs a shared narrative. And I think having these kind of crossover conversations, uh, whatever you call them, uh, is essential to a vibrant democracy. I would certainly echo that sentiment and say that, you know, as we share stories from different communities, it helps, the, it really does evolve the whole trust factor. It destigmatizes communities. Uh, it takes away the fear of, uh, you know, it's a fear from ethno-specific, ethno-cultural communities that, you know, sometimes is out there. So nothing more powerful than cross-cultural, um, educational material, you know, understanding communities. It just, A, it makes you a better Canadian citizen and it makes you a better person. Uh, so I think this is really, you know, quality, quality living and uh, so important. And I think, you know, we're celebrating 50 years of the Multicultural Act in Canada and uh, many on this panel have worked very hard throughout the years to continue and evolve the understanding and the strength of diversity, multiculturalism and ethnic media and the role it plays in contributing to a just society. I'm getting too excited about this. So I think somebody else should say something. <laughs> Well, you are ex officio the representative of an organization that represents ethnic journalists. 
from way back uh, from your father's time. So it's been how many, 40 years and on? 1978. So, we, we used to okay. meet in the Toronto Press Club. Toronto Press Club does not exist and we, we keep on going. So the little <laughs> engine that could, and now it's the bigger engine that would. So that's where we are. <laughs> So anyway, Blythe, do we have any more uh, questions? Yeah, there's uh, another one here. Uh, how are you measuring impact? Uh, how knowledgeable are readers about current issues? Do you measure this? We wish we could, okay? In other words, in terms of actual measurement, uh, the sad story is that there's no brand barometer metric situation set up independently to monitor ethnic media as you would be able to find for mainstream media. But uh, what we look at is, well, we track the stories, so we're able to figure out whether the story that you are interested in uh, how well it's tracking across what it is by 600 odd ethnic media sources in 25 languages that we track on a daily basis. So yeah, we can find out what what the chatter is in the ethnic media, so to speak, for starters. And then you can decide whether you want to jump in with that chatter. For example, I mean, we currently have a, car, uh, a client who's interested in a very particular sub-segment of the ethnic community, okay? Let's say, I don't want to disclose, but let's say they're aiming at women, okay, pregnant women in the ethnic community. So we have to sort out a little bit how we're going to help that client approach. Uh, the family column in the ethnic newspapers, the, 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 the female commentators, the advice columnists, the opinion makers within that community with regards to a, a certain pregnancy issue, okay? You know? Could be COVID. But I, I think I recall, and this goes back many years, that Dr. Catherine Murray in Vancouver did do a study, and this was several years ago, that actually looked at the impact of Chinese media in the in Vancouver GTA and found that the penetration and the impact was greater than the cumulative group of uh, English or French traditional media in the Vancouver GTA. So that's, uh, I, I can't cite the year that that study came out in, but certainly that was an impact study that I think is still relevant today. There was a study by Lynn Green, uh, I forget her first name, Professor Lynn Green from Ryerson. April, April the Lynn Green. April Lindgren, thank you, who was, you know, sometimes attacks me. Uh, April Lindgren was basically the author of a study that was the foundation of Brampton's extremely successful municipal outreach policy that involved both advertising, media outreach, media monitoring, and this has been going on for years, okay? It's a model for other municipalities. We've been consulted because we have them as a client. Sorry about that, I don't want to promote us, but so do you understand that you know, this can be done, micro done at the municipal level. It's not something that's for federal governments and big political parties and, you know, uh, the big guys only, okay? It can, an initiative to, to get your message out can be adjusted to uh, your budget, basically, I suppose is the bottom line, okay? And uh, that's it. I don't know. We've got, what, three minutes left in our assigned time here. And any questions? Um, I just wanted to jump in to the part about how knowledgeable are readers about current issues. Um, and it's not just readers, it's listeners uh, in terms of the, the radio programming and talk shows are extensive, uh, you know, particularly like we've got a wide variety of uh, Punjabi radio talk shows that we listen to. Um, the hosts, they're opinionated, the, the callers, the phone in segments, they're opinionated and um, and our, you know, our clients, they're very interested in, in this. It's a real street level conversations, getting a sense for the feeling from the community on current issues. Uh, so we find that uh, very, very prominent, you know, and then of course you've got your um, columns in the newspapers and, um, you know, and they're calling in about local issues. So, um, you know, politicians, government officials need to be paying attention. So, for example, um, you know, if you've got a talk show on 1350, 1350 AM out of Brampton, you know, if they're talking about the latest 
you know, hospital funding in Brampton, that's very important feedback to, to listen to and to uh, take into consideration. I think there's also a, 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 a new wave of communicators that are uh, skipping a regulatory environment. They're going straight to internet communication, blogging, and I, see, I think there's a plethora of that as well. So um, as, you know, the, as, every, as audiences evolve, um, entrepreneurs are looking at ways to be able to skip the regulatory environment that, that is sometimes seen as prohibitive. Thank you, Madeline. I think we've about reached our time limit here. So I just wanted to say thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Blight. Very well done. Thank you.